so I joined NVIDIA about four and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to take a new technology we had to a new set of customers, right? So, so when I joined, it was, you know, we have this great computing technology. We're trying to, trying to you know, figure out a strategy that takes it to, um, you know, people we don't, you know, currently do business with or don't use GPUs. Now we're seeing the next phase of Tesla, which is we had a single precision only product, then we had a double precision, and then in the Fermi architecture GPUs, we added a lot more double precision, uh, floating point performance, and ECC. And ECC, because when you scale to, you know, four, five, six, seven thousand nodes, um, having them operate collect correctly and reliably is, is incredibly important. And so, because uh, they're all working on the same problem, you know when that makes an error, particularly, actually, it's one of the things that makes uh, Linpack such a challenging benchmark, is that everything has to operate perfectly. And having reliability features inside these uh, technologies is, is critically important, right? It's there on the CPU side, needs to be there on the GPU side. So uh, one of the big news is, is uh, the, the supercomputer in China that reached number two in performance. Um, that's actually what, the, what was commonly paid attention to in, in a lot of the articles, you know, number two, great performance. But the real news, I think, was the fact that it was half the power of the a CPU cluster, right? So if you had built a CPU cluster at this point um, at the same performance, it would be double or actually probably a little more than double the power. So in terms of performance per watt, um, this is proof that the heterogeneous approach, kind of mixing processors of different types, a parallel and a sequential, and being able to share the workload across the two uh, is the right long-term solution. And we've actually seen uh, similar power advantages in other technologies like the cell-based approach. Um, Blue Jean's an efficient technology, but the major difference is the GPU is driven by commodity economics, right? We're in notebooks, we're in PCs, we're in game machines. And so that base gives you access to a lot of software developers. You know, software developers can then develop on standard machines, but then scale up to a data center. The, the challenge in supercomputing is all power. And it's actually the challenge in computing in general is power. Um, and you can look at actually every level of computing. In the notebook, it's power for battery life. Yeah. In, in a PC or workstation, it's power for performance. And it's limited by the amount of power you can get out of a single wall socket, right? It's a power limited problem. So how do you keep getting double 10 times, 100 times the performance out of that wall socket because it's a hard, hard limit infrastructure throughout the world, right? And it's the same in, in a data center. And it's the same in data center in two ways. One is you want to get to exascale. You want to get to these bigger and bigger computers, which is you know, a factor of 1,000 from where we are today. So how do you do that quick enough with the technology you have available, but within a reasonable power envelope, meaning something that more than one country or one site can afford, right? We'd like to have like peta, you know, petaflop scale computers. We have three in the world at this point. Um, you'd like to have 50, right? You'd like to have more than, more than a you know, select few have access to that. And I think with petascale, we have now have a roadmap with, um, with the machines that uh, have been built in China, with the machine that uh, Professor Matsuoka wants to build in Japan, which uh, his goal is to be incredibly power efficient. Um, that was his goal on the earlier machines, and I think it, it was, it, his vision has been proven. And now with the new effort around Tsubami 2.0, a huge emphasis around power efficiency. And it's not just benchmark. It's how can I take this capability we've, we've installed, put it in the hands of a bunch of scientists and engineers, and they're, they're getting really good results, you know, just world-leading results. But in the power, commonly associated with a, a much smaller cluster. You know, so we're trying to fit this, this power envelope. And so that's one direction, which is you know, how, do we, um, how do we keep scaling performance right, in, in a standard power envelope? I think the second is actually how do we give more and more people access to petaflop scale computing or you know, upper, these, these incredible, but you, you have to put it in a standard infrastructure. A standard data center can't be exotic technology. And you're trying to do more and more of those because it's, it's a very, very proven link between 
access to supercomputing cycles, access to these tools, and industrial development. Right? You see it in, in Germany, we're in Germany, which has an incredibly sophisticated automotive business. And a lot of that, the design, the design of the materials, the design of, of the airflow around the car, um, the engine design, a lot of, you now it's all driven by supercomputing technology. And so uh, you see the same in, in aeronautics, right? designing airplanes, see designing materials. So all of these aspects of industry are driven by supercomputing. And so you want to put these very, very capable supercomputers in the hands of everyone. So we do it in two ways. Again, we do the data center, but we also do it on the workstation. Uh, we have examples currently of where we have a tool that would traditionally run on a shared resource like a cluster. And once you take a piece of that technology, put it on the workstation, and put it on every engineer's desk, well, the cluster is used for the large problem they need to solve very occasionally, but your day-to-day -day work is now done on the workstation. Um, electromagnetics, right? Uh, very little known that your cell phone, the antenna in your cell phone, was most likely simulated and designed with a GPU because we can now take that level of simulation for a cell phone or a notebook computer or anything that generates radio waves and we can simulate it on a workstation with a GPU and it completely changes people's lives because rather than waiting in line they can actually do their own work on their own tool in their own time. What, what is an exascale system? So, the, the industry has now moved on because I think the formula for petaflop computing is now established, right? And, and uh, obviously I believe GPUs are a big part of that because we've just announced a petaflop um, computer in a, in a way that, that virtually anyone can build, right? It's, it's now standard technology. Um, now when you start thinking about exascale, again, it's a factor of a thousand. And I think there's a big preoc preoccupation with exascale because there's a lot of uh, there's there's a lot of uh, kind of opinions and a lot of different opinions on or uh, different options on how we get there, because th the knobs and dials or the, the the options that we had to go from uh, teraflop computing to petaflop computing, they're gone, right? Voltage scaling in CPUs, right? The the more and more power efficient CPUs, a lot of that's gone. We don't have that option anymore, so. The challenge becomes, how do you do something a thousand times faster, and we talked earlier about power, but within a reasonable power envelope? So you can approach this, and, and actually our approach is from energy, right? So we hear a lot of people going latency or not latency or everything, but the whole equation can be reduced to energy, which is how many, how many picojoules or how many actually now energy is measured in nanojoules, and to get to exascale, we need to be in picojoules. We need to be that factor of a thousand, because if you think you're going up a factor of a thousand in performance, you can't go a factor of a thousand in power, so you need to reduce the power of operation by a thousand. And so, where a CPU is now measured in 10 to the minus ninth or nanojoules, we now need to get to the picojoule. How do you do that, right? And how do you do that architecturally? What is the, what is the processor look like? How is that processor connected into a system? How are they all networked together? And so I think there's a preoccupation with that problem because it's, um, it's not a clear problem coming from the point of view of conventional technology. Now, of course, NVIDIA as a parallel computing company, we believe parallel computing is the answer because already a GPU is about 50 times more power efficient than a CPU per operation, right? And it just comes down to the fundamental nature of a GPU, right? And we, we need to be that much more power efficient because we're trying to run 20,000 threads, 50,000 threads inside the GPU as opposed to, you know, four or eight inside a CPU. Well, those 20,000 threads better be pretty darn power efficient. Now, our path is this parallel computing path. We have, uh, we believe, circuit approaches. We, we know what we're doing on process to, to get to the exascale. Now, that's not to say it's easy. It's going to be um, engineering, but we think all the pieces are there to get us to exascale. But we're one solution, and I think the industry is going to, um, we're going to push on it, and we're going to argue about it, and we're going to discuss it for a number of years yet um, before we really come down to what the exascale solution is.